All right, so uh, thank you for joining our webinar on single and dual valve methods for head pressure control. So we'll discuss the operation of both methods and how they can be used to control high side pressure and keep your refrigeration system running year round. So I appreciate the uh, introduction, uh, Sean. So as Sean mentioned, if you can do me a favor and type any questions you have into the chat section, that'd be great. Uh, Sean's gonna filter those questions and at the end we will uh, get the opportunity to answer uh, hopefully most if not all of them. So let's dive right into it. All right, so here's a link to our website, www.sporland.com. If you scroll down under the main website, um, there's a section titled HVACR Training and Learning. You can find a whole bunch of webinars that our engineering team created during the pandemic. And on the bottom right hand side, you'll find a link to the Sporland product literature um, under the section called Literature, Bulletins, and More. Oops. Okay. All right. So in the middle, then you'll find pressure regulating valves, and this is the section where you'll find quite a bit of the literature um, that we'll be discussing today. And you can always go back to that and refresh yourself on um, head pressure control valves. So here is today's agenda. So we're going to start by talking about why do we need head pressure control. Then I'll do a little bit of a sidebar and we'll go through AOF, which is the annual walk-in energy factor applicable to walk-in coolers and freezers of under 3,000 square feet or less. Uh, I'm gonna provide you with a relevant example to help you understand why head pressure control is important and we'll use uh, AOF uh, to do that. From there, talk about air side head pressure control versus refrigerant side head pressure control and then we'll go into several of the different valve combinations. So we'll talk split condenser valves, then we'll talk about head pressure control by flooding of the condenser, and specifically the ORI and ORD combination, the OROA, LAC, which is our low ambient control, and the A8 and A9, which are more of the industrial uh, size, um, head pressure control valves used in uh, larger applications. And then finally, how to calculate the added refrigerant that is required for flooding of the condenser. All right, so there is three factors that affect condenser capacity, and they are your, coil, your TD, your airflow, and your coil size. So, TD, that's the difference between the air temperature and the refrigerant saturation temperature in the condenser. So as your TD increases, your condenser capacity increases as well. And so the condenser is actually becoming more effective as your ambient temperature falls, which is ambient temperature falls in TD increases. Factor number two is your airflow. So VFDs and fan cycle switches are used to decrease airflow and reduce the condenser efficiency. And then your third factor is your coil size. And so you're directly impacting the coil size when you use split condenser arrangements and condenser holdback valves that change the condenser's effective surface area and then ultimately impact the capacity. So as your ambient temperature falls, less heat may need to be rejected through the condenser. And at the same time, an increase in the TD allows the condenser to reject more heat, causing a drop in your high side pressure. And as, uh, as that high side pressure continues to drop, further actions can be needed to prevent your high side pressure from falling to unacceptable levels that would impact your system performance in a negative way. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the purpose of head pressure control. So two, two main things. One is that it will maintains your condenser or liquid pressure high enough to ensure that the TEVs uh, can feed enough refrigerant to the evaporators. And two, you'll maintain your discharge pressure high enough for the proper operation of your hot gas defrost or your hot gas bypass 
if the systems we're talking about have hot gas defrost or bypass. So it's important to note that when the system head pressure falls too low, it can result in significant performance issues. And some of those negative effects of poor head pressure control are an elevated room temperature that is caused by underfeeding liquid to the evaporator. And additional symptoms or negative impacts of underfeeding the evaporator would be improper oil return that's caused by having less refrigerant mass flow and velocity. And then high evaporator superheats would also result in a corresponding increase in your discharge temperature. So and a rule of thumb is that for every one degree increase in the superheat of the vapor entering the compressor, it'll result in a discharge temperature increase of approximately one degree. So by designing the system with proper head pressure control, you'll be able to prevent these performance issues from occurring during your low ambient temperatures. All right, so I mentioned on the previous slide that if your head pressure falls too low, you'll starve the evaporator of refrigerant. This is because the capacity of the TEV is directly related to the pressure drop across the TEV. So when your head pressure drops, so does the pressure drop across your TEV. So what I'm showing you here, we have a capacity chart that I took from our bulletin 1010, showing the capacity of several Sporlin TEVs, which are your thermostatic expansion valves, with R404A refrigerant at various evaporator temperatures. So this is just an example here. It applies to all refrigerants, obviously. Um, bottom table shows you the correction factor that must be applied based on the true pressure drop across your TEV. So using 20 degree evaporator as an example, if you were to decrease the pressure drop across the TEV from 200 PSI to 125 PSI, that actually results in a capacity decrease of 21% that that TEV is capable of achieving. So uh, I took the correction factor of one and divided by the correction factor of 1.26, which I've circled both of those, just to kind of show you how I came up with that capacity decrease calculation of 21%. So one of the determining factors in deciding what your minimum allowable system head pressure should be is based on finding the minimum TEV pressure drop or delta P required for its capacity to meet the demands of the evaporator load. All right, so getting into a little bit of a sidebar here before we really kind of dive into the operation of head pressure controls, but uh, I assure you it, it's really gonna be relevant to painting a picture of, of why head pressure control is important. So bear with me as I go through uh, AWEF because it, it's definitely relevant. So. What is AOF? It is an annual walk-in energy factor mandated by the Department of Energy or DOE. So if your walk-in cooler or freezer is 3,000 square feet or less, condensing units and evaporators on those units that were manufactured after July 2020 have to conform to that AOF standard. So in order to meet the energy factors, your OEMs have actually lowered their head pressure setting on their equipment, thus allowing them to lower the compression ratio and save energy uh, in the compressor. So for medium temp units, your OEMs have really standardized a low ambient head pressure setting between 145 and 150 PSI. And many low temp units, uh, the OEMs have decreased their head pressure setting down to as low as 100 PSI. So uh, some of the viewers here may have seen or already been working on some of these units. So here I am showing you the nomenclature uh, for Heatcraft and Trenton condensing units. Your top line here, beginning with HCH, that's an example of a Heatcraft model number. The bottom line, beginning with TEH, that's the Trenton nomenclature. And then both of these models or, or nomenclatures have an M in the middle of the designation, and that's actually telling you that it's a medium temperature unit. If it was a low temp unit, you would see an L instead of the M. 
So these designations are, can be used to identify the head pressure control valve setting on a unit installed in the field. Kind of a side note, uh, Heatcraft has recently started offering their low temp units with either a 100 PSI or 145 PSI low ambient pressure setting which can be determined by referencing the revision designation in their model codes. Um, all right, so looking in the bottom right, AWEF com compliant condensers, they're gonna specify AWEF on the equipment label. And that's what I'm showing you in the picture in the bottom right-hand corner, which is a picture off of, uh, off of a unit. And so I've already mentioned this, but the non-AOF units or the units that were manufactured prior to AWEF becoming uh, uh, becoming a law, they likely have a higher low ambient head pressure setting than these AWEF compliant units. So you're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this. Uh, as a contractor or a technician, it's not uncommon to uh, have to replace a condensing unit on an existing walk-in cooler or freezer. And when you are replacing a non-AOF condensing unit with one of the new AOF condensing units, this new unit is actually gonna have a lower head pressure setting. So we've discovered on many occasions that the existing TEV was not properly sized for the lower differential pressure that it's seeing with the new AOF units. And that has resulted in unsatisfactory room temperatures uh, during your winter months. So if you're replacing only the condensing unit, I actually recommend that you investigate the existing expansion valve and make sure it's large enough and you do that on the front end. So you might end up needing a larger TEV that can meet the evaporator load requirements at the lower head pressure. So I feel it's a very realistic example that ties nicely into the importance of having proper head pressure control. And I need to make sure that uh, I'm clear that I'm, I'm not telling you that the new AOF condensing units have improper head pressure control. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the lower head pressure results in getting less capacity out of your existing TEVs. And so at some point, if the head pressure falls too low due to improper head pressure control, you won't feed enough refrigerant into your evaporators. That's the kind of bottom line point with this. All right, so now we're gonna discuss the different methods of head pressure control. And those can include your air side and refrigerant side head pressure control. So your air side options consist of fan control, which can be done using VFDs or cycling fans on and off in stages. Uh, as you'll recall, airflow across the condenser, that was one of the three factors that affect the condenser's capacity. Refrigerant side options consist of splitting the condenser or flooding of the condenser. So your air side head pressure control actually does not allow the head pressure or liquid pressure to remain constant during varying low ambient temps. That's maybe one downside of it, but an, oh, uh-oh. Mess that up. Okay, sorry about that. Another disadvantage is that even with all the fans cycled off, a cold windy day can have an adverse impact on head pressure if you are only deploying air side control. So a system designer very frequently might choose to use a combination of air side and refrigerant side head pressure control because air side alone typically does not work uh, well at really low ambient temps which makes it necessary to deploy some of the refrigerant side head pressure control options that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, and I will be focused on the refrigerant side methods of head pressure control uh, for the rest of the discussion here. All right. Okay, so we're on uh, poll question number one, which is what is the intent of head pressure control? A, enables uh, thermal expansion valves to feed enough refrigerant to the evaporators. B, higher head pressure will save energy at the compressor. C, hot gas bypass requires high enough head pressure. Or D, both A and C.
All right, I'm going to close the poll in a few seconds here. All right, so um, majority of everyone got this right. The first full question was, what is the intent of head pressure control? A, enables thermal expansion valves to feed enough refrigerant to the evaporators. B, higher head pressure will save energy at the compressor. C, hot gas bypass requires high enough head, pr head pressure. Or D, both A and C. Um, it looks like 74% uh, um, got it correct and chose um, option D, which was both A and C, and only 2% chose uh, option C, and the remainder, which was 24% of the people, chose option A, which is enables thermal extension belts to feed enough refrigerant to the evaporators. And uh, now back to you. All right, so now we're getting into uh, three-way split condenser valves here. So I mentioned uh, that splitting the condenser is a method of refrigerant side head pressure control. And splitting the condenser was gonna allow you to reduce the condenser capacity by 50% during low ambient conditions. And that's typically done using a three-way split condensing valve, such as the one in the picture here. So I'm gonna cover the operation of the valve, and then I'll show you a diagram so how you can see how it's applied. All right. so. When de-energized, the three-way split condenser valve is going to divert or split your refrigerant flow to two condenser circuits during summer operation. This is considered your normal full condenser mode. During normal full condenser mode, the refrigerant flow is split evenly between the two halves of the condenser. So notice the seat disc is positioned to allow the flow of discharge gas through both the upper and lower ports simultaneously. However, when you energize the valve, the valve is going to shift and divert all flow to only the summer winter condenser. So that's what I'm showing here. So this is uh, full condenser mode during low ambient. It shifts, it closes off that upper port, and all flow is going to the summer winter condenser. Okay, so. All right, so typically your split condenser valve is gonna be controlled by an ambient temperature control that is set for a specific outdoor temperature. And it can also be controlled by some sort of a high, high side pressure control device. So the picture here is depicting our version of the three-way split condenser valve that contains the bleed port, because we have some variations that do not have the bleed port. And the bleed port is allowing you to transfer the refrigerant back from the idle condenser back to the suction header by venting it up through the uh, up through the piston and then through uh, the pilot assembly back to the suction header. All right, so here's the diagram depicting the exact three-way split condenser valve that I showed on the previous slide. So you can see the model number. 12D13B-SC. And so the B in that model number indicates that it has the bleed port. The SC at the end indicates that it's a split condenser valve rather than a heat reclaim valve, which actually looks nearly identical. So when your summer only condenser becomes idle, the trapped refrigerant should be removed. So if you're using a variation of the three-way split condenser valve that does not contain a bleed port, removal of that trapped refrigerant is accomplished by installing a separate pump-out solenoid along with a restrictor and a check valve. So that is not what I'm depicting here because this particular three-way valve uh, or three-way split condenser valve does contain the bleed port, which allows for the uh, removal of the refrigerant from the idle condenser without that separate uh, pump out solenoid. So I'll show you the other example um, on the next slide. Regarding a check valve, it's good practice to install a check valve at the condenser outlet to prevent refrigerant migration to the idle coil during low ambient temps. 
So in order to provide equal flow to both condenser circuits during your full condenser mode or during the summer, you need to have another check valve located at the summer winter condenser outlet so that you can introduce identical pressure drop through both halves of the condenser. So what I'm saying there, you'll notice the check valve on the top of the picture on the summer winter condenser. If you didn't have that check valve there during your high ambience when you are uh, feeding refrigerant to both halves of the condenser, without the check valve on the top half, you would not have identical pressure drop and you would end up getting more uh, refrigerant flow to the summer only condenser. So that's what I'm intending to say there. All right, here's another example uh, of splitting the condenser, different combination of valves. So some supermarkets actually prefer to use two normally open solenoid valves instead of the traditional three-way split condenser valve that I showed you on the previous slide. Flow is always gonna be present through the summer winter condenser section and therefore a solenoid coil is not needed on this normally open solenoid. But that dummy solenoid valve is present to balance flow via pressure drop during full condenser mode. So same concept with having the check valve at the outlet of both halves of the condenser. Even though you're not, not using the dummy solenoid as far as actually ever closing it, having it there balances the pressure drop. In this example, an auxiliary solenoid valve is needed to bleed the refrigerant from the idle condenser. So you can see here the XSP10, we're utilizing that for this purpose. So it has a relatively small port and serves as the additional restriction in the line back to suction. So on the previous slide with the three-way split condenser valve with bleed port, you didn't need that separate pump out solenoid to remove the refrigerant from the idle condenser coil. All right. All right, so we're on poll question number two, which is a true or false question. Um, three advantages of using a split condenser valve that contains the bleed feature are, um, one, without the bleed feature, a separate dedicated solenoid restrictor and check valve are needed to pump out the idle condenser. Um, the bleed feature saves on valve material costs. Um, two, without the bleed feature, a separate dedicated solenoid restrictor and check valve are needed to pump out the idle condenser. The bleed feature saves on electrical energy. Or um, option three, um, bleeding the idle condenser reduces the total refrigerant charge in the system. And uh, I'm about to launch a poll for this. Um, I just did it this way because I couldn't fit all the, we couldn't fit all the characters into the question. Um, so just wanna make sure you guys could get a chance to read this and I'm gonna launch it in a few seconds here. There we go. All right, I'm gonna close it here in a couple seconds. Right. So it looks like majority got this correct for the true and false. 93% chose uh, option A, which is true. 7% chose false. Um, and I'm gonna reread the question one more time for you guys. Three advantages of using a split condenser valve that contains the bleed feature are um, one, without the bleed feature, a separate dedicated solenoid restrictor and check valve are needed to pump out the idle condenser. The bleed feature saves on valve material cost. Two, without the bleed feature, a separate dedicated solenoid restrictor and check valve are needed to pump out the idle condenser. The bleed feature saves on electrical energy. Um, and bleeding the idle condenser reduces the total refrigerant charge in the system. And like I said, everyone uh, pretty much got that correct, Adam. Uh, now back to you. Perfect. All right, so now that we've discussed splitting the condenser as a method of head pressure control, we're gonna move on to flooding of the condenser. So condenser flooding is a different method of head pressure control 
um, that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. It's also reducing the effective area of the condenser, but it's accomplishing that differently than splitting of the condenser is. So this is one of the two valve versions of head pressure control, and it's an adjustable combination here. So it's the ORI and ORD valve. So the ORI is frequently referred to as the condenser holdback valve, and it's located in the drop leg of the condenser. And it got its name from the way it operates because ORI stands for open on rise of inlet pressure. So in this scenario, it's responding to the pressure at the outlet of the condenser, and it's fully open when the condenser pressure is above the ORI set point, which for example, would be during high ambient. So as your condenser pressure falls below the valve setting during low ambient conditions, it modulates, it backs refrigerant up into the condenser, uh, flooding that condenser coil and uh, lowering the capacity of the condenser. So its function is to maintain a constant pressure in the condenser. By flooding the condenser, we're reducing the condenser's capacity by taking away its effective surface area. So continuous modulating of the ORI, which is what happens in order to maintain that condenser pressure at a constant pressure, it does have an influence on the receiver pressure, but it's only directly controlling your condenser pressure. So in order to avoid having erratic receiver pressure, you need a separate ORD valve that's required to control that receiver pressure. The ORD also gets its name from its operation. And so it's opening on rise of differential pressure. So it's gonna be pressurizing the receiver with discharge gas and maintaining a constant receiver pressure for stable TEV operation during low ambient. So the ORD should be fully closed during your high ambient conditions and only bypassing discharge gas during your low ambient temps. All right, so here I'm just showing you how the ORI actually works to control that condenser pressure. So the ORI is an adjustable valve. It has an adjustment range of 65 to 225 PSIG. And you can see in the picture that it has a flexible bellows above the seat disc. The outlet pressure is uh, exerted on the underside of the bellows and the top side of the seat disc. And because the effective area of those bellows is equal to the area of the port, the outlet pressure is canceled. And that allows the inlet pressure or your condensing pressure and the spring pressure to be the two operating forces that are controlling the position of the ORI. Side note is that we do offer spring kits for the ORI that have a larger range of adjustment from 100 to 290 pounds, depending on the refrigerant and the application. So you don't want to use this valve for R410A refrigerant uh, because it doesn't have a high enough uh, maximum operating pressure. So for R410A, we'd recommend our LAC-HP valve that was specifically intended for the R410A application. And I'll, I'll get into the LAC more uh, several slides from now. So a couple of final points that I want to make on the installation now of the ORI. So because the bellows is a flexible seal and it's responsive due to the flexibility of those bellows, but it is susceptible to failure due to overheating because of that flexibility. So you wanna make sure that you don't overheat this valve when you're soldering it into the system because a leaky bellows can impact the valve setting and it can and has gone unnoticed for extended periods of time. All right. Here's another uh, good cutaway of the ORI with just different internal components labeled. You can see that adjustment spring. Um, and and it, again, it's adjustable, right? So you can take that cap off the top, use a uh, Allen wrench and change, adjust the setting accordingly. Um, and then you've got the seat disc and the seat labeled and the bellows shown again. All right, 
ORD valve. Again, this one is used uh, in combination with the ORI. You need them both together. So here I'm providing more detail on that ORD, which is commonly referred to as the receiver pressurizing valve. The ORD comes in only a single size, single port size. So it's the ORD-4. And the standard differential pressure setting is 20 PSIG, but it is available with a 25, 30, or 35 pound pressure setting as needed. So again, this valve's operating on rise of differential. The standard ORD, which has the 20 pound setting, has a cracking pressure of 14. So in order to avoid bypassing your hot gas during those summer months, it should be installed on a system having a maximum pressure drop between the compressor and the receiver of less than 14 PSI. Because again, you don't wanna bypass discharge gas uh, during high ambience or during the summer. So got a table here on the bottom right showing the recommended ORD setting based on the system pressure drop between the compressor and that receiver. So again, it's available with different settings. And it should also be noted that the ORD is not adjustable in the field. It's, it's coming preset. Okay, so moving on to the ORA, sorry, OROA, which is a single valve version of head pressure control. Uh, that's designed to stack liquid in the condenser and bypass hot gas to the receiver. It's essentially a combination of the separate ORI and ORD valves. And when you desire to use only one valve in the system, you can consider that OROA. So this valve is responding to your outlet or receiver pressure. And again, it gets its name from the way it operates because the OROA stands for open on rise of outlet pressure or in this case, receiver pressure. And I'll go into more detail on that operation on the next slide here. Installation requires three connections to be made, which is one less than the separate ORI and ORD had. And this valve is actually non-adjustable. So I mentioned the ORI was adjustable. This one's non-adjustable, available with one of three standard pressure settings. 100, 180, and 210. There's other pressure settings as well, if needed. Um, and it is also not suitable for R410A or CO2 because it does not have a high enough maximum operating pressure range rating. So here is a cutaway of that OROA so that you can see kind of how it operates. So. I want to point out that it has a ORD built into its mechanism on the compressor discharge side of the valve. And so as you remember, that ORD opens on rise of your differential pressure. You've got a dome-shaped element at the top that is charged with an inert gas that creates force on the top side of that diaphragm. And this force is based on our factory uh, set pressure setting, based on how you order the valve from the factory. So. You can see that the condensing pressure and the receiver pressure are both acting on the bottom side of the diaphragm and are directly opposing that force um, created yeah, by the inert gas in the dome. The valve's port area, because it's small in relationship to the area of the diaphragm, the condenser pressure actually has very little impact on the operation of the valve. So it's really your receiver pressure that's controlling the operation of this valve. And when your receiver pressure is above the pressure setting during the summertime operation, the valve is wide open and you have unrestricted flow from the condenser to the receiver. Uh, as that receiver pressure falls during your low ambient conditions, the OROA modulates and begins to uh, restrict the flow of liquid from the condenser uh, to the outlet, of, uh, restrict the flow of liquid and stack liquid in that condenser and flood that condenser. When you've got enough uh, differential pressure between that condenser and receiver, that ORD is gonna open and bypass your discharge gas to the receiver to keep your receiver at a constant pressure. 
All right. Now we're going to talk about the LAC, which is the low stands for low ambient control. LAC is another one valve option for head pressure control. And it's accomplishing the same uh, flooding of the condenser or stacking of the liquid in the condenser while bypassing your discharge gas to the receiver. So it's non adjustable, charged with an inert gas to a setting of either 100, 180, or 210. Um, and similar to the OROA, um, with the development of the AWEF condensing units, we've made these LAC valves readily available with other set points or settings. So here I'm going to show you some additional detail in the form of cutaways of the various versions of the LAC. Starting on the left side, your LAC4 is responding to your discharge pressure. Somewhat difficult to see, but there is actually some clearance around the push rods in which the discharge pressure bleeds to the underside of the diaphragm. And that discharge pressure is directly opposing your dome pressure. And that, which I mentioned, the dome pressure is based on uh, our, the inert gas that we charge that with in the factory. When your outdoor ambient falls, condensing pressure falls, discharge pressure falls below the valve setting, and the seat moves away from that discharge port, allowing discharge gas to bypass the condenser while simultaneously restricting the flow of liquid from the outlet of the condenser. So during the summer, you should have full unrestricted uh, liquid flow from the condenser to the receiver. That's a common theme with all of our uh, head pressure control valves that are designed for flooding of the condenser. Picture on the right, you've got your LAC5 and LAC10. And those are responding to receiver pressure, not discharge pressure. So when the receiver pressure drops below the valve setting, the seat moves away from the discharge port, allows discharge gas to bypass the condenser again while simultaneously restricting the flow of liquid from the outlet of the condenser. Picture in the middle, you've got the LAC4-DS, which is actually a dual setting. Uh, the dome contains a spring that is creating less pressure than the inert gas it's charged with. So when you install it, you'll determine if you want the valve to be set at the higher or lower pressure setting. And if you want the lower pressure setting, you're going to clip that capillary tube and bleed the inert gas out of the dome. So if you don't bleed that charge, the LAC4DS is going to be set at the higher pressure setting. Uh, one more note here is that the we do offer high pressure versions of the LAC that are suitable for R410A. Uh, I mentioned that on the previous slide. So the LAC5-HP and LAC-10-HP are those 410A versions, and they actually contain a remote sensing bulb. Okay, so. Here's the diagram of a installation for the LAC. What I wanna point out here, if you have a scenario uh, of cold ambient temps and you have the system offline, your discharge or receiver pressures may fall below the set point. So it is possible that you would actually migrate the refrigerant from the condenser into the discharge line, sorry, from the receiver into the discharge line or the condenser during that off cycle. So for this reason, we actually suggest installation of a check valve in the drop leg between the LAC and the receiver to prevent that charge migration, or refrigerant migration, I should say. So that is a difference between the LAC uh, and the OROA and the ORI slash ORD combination that did not require that check valve between the outlet and the receiver. All right, so let's look at some of the troubleshooting tips for the ORA, sorry, OROA and the LAC. So if you have no refrigerant at the TEVs, possibly you've got low system charge. Also, maybe you're not bypassing discharge gas during low ambient, which 
you should be during low ambient. And the way that you might be able to identify that is by feeling the line between the outlet of the LAC and the receiver. And it should actually be warm during low ambient um, because of the fact that you're bypassing discharge gas and, and you're mixing, mixing it with the uh, condensed liquid from the condenser that's also going through those valves. So if you have a warm line between the LAC and the, or sorry, if you have a cold line between the LAC and the receiver, that would be indicative of the fact that you are not bypassing that discharge gas like you should. Um, if you're bypassing discharge gas during high ambient, which again, you don't want to do that during high ambient, you can know that by feeling, again, feeling the line between the LAC and the receiver. And that should actually be slightly warmer than ambient. It should not be hot. So if, if it's hot to the touch, um, uh, during uh, you, that could be mean that you're bypassing your discharge gas during high ambient, which you don't want to. The other complaint is your high condenser pressure, which you could determine that because maybe you have an undersized receiver during the summer. So we'll, we'll touch on that more. Uh, or you have a dirty condenser or blocked condenser airflow. So one note on that undersized receiver is if the receiver is undersized, the technician is gonna have to remove refrigerant every spring to prevent high head pressures at the design temps or during the summer months. They'll then have to go in and add refrigerant back in the fall so that the system contains enough refrigerant for flooding of the condenser. So Obviously, you've got a added labor charge here that would be avoided if the receiver was properly sized, but you do have a potential workaround method um, by doing what I'm just mentioned there. All right, so uh, more troubleshooting for the OROA and LAC, constant bypassing of discharge gas. That could happen due to the natural pressure drop exceeding the OROA's capability. So I mentioned it's got that internal ORD that is opening on rise of differential pressure and that you need to make sure that the pressure drop between the compressor and the receiver is below the setting of that ORD. Another reason for bypassing discharge gas could be debris in the port or overheating of the valve. So regarding debris in the deport, I wanna mention that you can order a inlet strainer that is purchased separately and could be installed in the LAC4 and the OROA if you desire to do that. Doesn't come installed, uh, but it could be ordered and you could go ahead and install those. All right, we're on the third poll question. Um, which is, which of the following can be used with R410A refrigerant? A, ORI and ORD combination, B, OROA, C, LAC-HP, high pressure version of the LAC model, or D, all the above? I'm going to leave it open for a few more seconds. And go. Oh, all right. So, for the third poll question, which of the following can be used with R410A refrigerant? 3% uh, chose option A, which is ORI and ORD combination. 3% chose option B, OROA. 78% uh, chose the correct answer, which is option C. LAC-HP, high pressure version of the LAC model, and 15% chose option D, which was all the above. And uh, now back to you, Adam. Okay, so here's another uh, two valve answer to the question of how to control head pressure. So we're talking about the A8 and A9 here. And these products are part of the Locon line manufactured by the Refrigeration Specialty Division of Parker Hannifin. So 
the A8 and A9, they're serving the same purpose as the ORI and ORD, but they contain higher available capacity ratings for industrial applications and supermarkets. So that is your condenser holdback. The A9, or you could use the A8OE, are used as your receiver pressure valve. It is our opinion that the A8OE has better dampening for system instability than the A9, but supermarkets tend to use the A9 because um, it's a little bit less expensive. So that tends to be what you'll see more about in the field for your receiver pressurizing valve. Both the A9 and the A8OE are responding to outlet pressure as opposed to differential pressure. And then both of these or all of these valves are adjustable and serviceable. So you can rebuild these and make adjustments to the settings on them. And these are not UL listed for 410A. So you wouldn't use these for R410A either. All right. So here's some instructions on how to adjust the A8, which is your uh, condenser holdback valve. So it's best to adjust this valve when the ambient is near your minimum outdoor temperature. You wanna always set this valve first before the A9. So you're gonna make sure that you have enough condenser fans running to reach the desired setting that you wanna achieve with this A8 or that you wanna set it to. Gotta make sure there's enough system load to set this valve you're gonna to wanna to shut your A9 off to the receiver. So you want that receiver pressure valve, the A9 to be closed when you're setting this A8. And now you can set the A8 to the desired setting. So between zero and 90 PSIG, one complete turn of the adjusting screw is gonna change the set point approximately 20 PSI. And between 90 and 400 PSIG, one complete turn will change the set point by approximately 70 PSI. I also wanna note that if you are using refrigerant side head pressure control in conjunction with air side control, um, which is very common, you wanna make sure that the fans are all turned off approximately 20 PSI G higher above the A8 set point. So you don't wanna still be cycling fans on and off uh, below the pressure setting of this A8. So a few comments now on rebuilding or servicing the A8, as I mentioned that the valve is rebuildable. So notice the location of the gauge port. So years ago, we actually decided to relocate the gauge port from the cartridge assembly to the valve body. So if you ever are working on or replacing the cartridge on a old A8, you're actually gonna lose your gauge port because the new cartridge assembly doesn't contain one. So I want you to be aware of that because you will need to install your own pressure tap uh, in order to get the valve set after replacing that cartridge assembly. All right, so here are some instructions for adjusting the A9, which is your receiver pressure valve. This regulator should be set under actual low ambient conditions. And I already mentioned this, but you want to adjust this after setting the A8 condenser holdback valve. Important to note, the setting of this A9 should be at least 10 pounds below the set point of the A8. To adjust the valve, you're gonna loosen the seal nut, turn the adjusting stem clockwise to raise the pressure or counterclockwise to lower the pressure. Range A, one turn is equal to approximately 16 PSI. In a range B, A9, one turn of that adjustment stem is gonna equal approximately 25 PSI. So you'll be able to uh, detect hot gas flow through the valve by listening, to, listening for flow or feeling the outlet pipe for warmth. So <clears throat> again, you don't want this valve active during high ambience because this is just, bypassing your discharge gas uh, around the condenser to the receiver. And this valve is gonna maintain that constant liquid pressure in the receiver for feeding of your expansion valves at the evaporators. 
All right, so now how to calculate charge for condenser flooding. So when you are, when condenser flooding is used uh, for head pressure control on a system, extra refrigerant is stacked up in the condenser during winter operation. And that extra refrigerant has to go someplace in the summer. So this is where the receiver becomes, have, the receiver becomes critical. Valve side head pressure control requires a receiver and it has to be properly sized. So our tech support team will get calls from time to time. Hey, why isn't my head pressure control valves operating properly? And we'll find out there's no receiver on the system. That's a problem. The extra refrigerant charge and the receiver size, both critical components. Um, so not only is it critical to actually have a receiver, but the receiver needs to be large enough to hold that normal refrigerant charge, plus the extra charge required to flood that condenser during low ambient temps. And on the slide here, I'm showing a picture of our Bulletin 90-30-1, which gives you uh, detailed instructions on how to calculate the proper amount of refrigerant required to flood the condenser. So feel free to look that up on our, on our website. All right, we're on the fourth poll question, which is a true or false. Um, the receiver provides a way of storing the added charge required for condenser flooding during the summer. A true, B false. Right, I'm gonna close the poll here in a few seconds. All right, go. All right, so the uh, true or false question was the receiver provides a way of storing the added charge required for condenser flooding during the summer. 67% um, chose true and 33% uh, chose false. And now back to you, Adam. Okay. All right, so here's an example of combining various methods of head pressure controls. So in the diagram here, we're depicting your industrial style head pressure control valves, which again is the Flocon series A8 and A9. Let's see here, so it's, it's not uncommon to combine both air side head pressure control with valve side uh, refrigerant control to achieve the desired head pressure. And I, I alluded to that previously. So here's an example where we've got both. And here's the sequence of events um, as ambient temperatures fall. So you're gonna stage your fans ultimately down to the final bank of two or even one fan uh, with or without variable frequency drive. You could also split the condenser to minimize the surface area of the coil by deactivating that uh, summer condenser. Finally, you'll finish staging the fans off uh, and as mentioned, very good idea to have all fans cycled off before engaging the holdback valve and flooding of the condenser. So you'll note here that in this example, final bank of fans turn off at 180. We've got the A8 uh, set at 165. So it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna throttle and flood the condenser until all fans are cycled off here because it is set at 165 pounds. We've set the final fans to cycle off at 180. And then you'll notice the receiver pressure valve, A9, is set at 150 pounds, which we said previously has to be at least 10 pounds lower than the condenser holdback valve in terms of the setting. Okay, so uh, in this example, we've substituted the ORI and ORD for the A8 and 9. We've already discussed the ORI and ORD. Um, these valves may simply have inadequate capacity for large industrial systems, which is when the A8 and A9 would be deployed. But I'm illustrating that here just to uh, show you the functionality again of the different valves. Getting down to the final couple slides here. 
Um, I want to show you a little trick that you can do with the ORD. So we've actually only ever made one size of ORD, and that is the ORD4. Uh, and same with the OROA, one size only. So the four in the model number is a relative term that indicates the diameter of the port in the ORD. Um, <clears throat> so because we only make one size, it's good to know that you could actually install multiple ORD fours in parallel to increase the flow. So that's kind of a general statement about all Sporlin head pressure control valves, that they can be installed in parallel to provide more refrigerant flow for large systems um, that have capacity requirements greater than any single valve's capacity. So we've seen systems with two, three, or even four ORDs in parallel, which may have been a good reason to create a ORD uh, with an increased capacity, but we just never did. And that is basically my final slide here. I'm just reiterating our website, sporland.com. My contact info, uh, I'm in the Chicago territory, which is most of Illinois and Indiana. If you're in that territory, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, otherwise, we've got over 60 sales engineers in North America and Mexico. Uh, definitely figure out who your local sales engineer is. But if you're not aware of who that is, contact headquarters. We've got tech support at headquarters, and then they can also direct you to your local sales engineer. And then here uh, is a QR code to sign up for Chili News, which is our quarterly uh, newsletter keep you up to date on uh, updates and new products that we're making at Sporlin. Let's turn it over to Sean for a few questions here. All right, uh, first thank you Adam for the presentation and God, it was really informative. Uh, I just wanted to clarify the answer to the last poll question, it was um, true. And the question was the receiver provides a way of storing the added charge required for condenser flooding during the summer. Um, and now we do have a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, and I will start off as, um, what do you recommend as a minimum pressure drop across the EV? Across, oh, yeah, across the expansion, expansion valve? Sounds like that's yeah, what we're electrical, talking about. Yeah, the electrical expansion valve. Mm. Well, so kind of a, all right, so, minimum pressure drop so for for like a tev we say probably around no less than really around 50 pounds what i would say you need to have enough pressure drop across the downstream distributor because your total pressure drop is going to be set across the electric expansion valve and the downstream distributor so you need to have a the pressure drop across the distributor is actually going to determine what the minimum pressure drop is across the expansion valve. So I, uh, I can't really I can't really put an exact number to that. All right, and then let's see, um, we got one more or two more here. Um, how could a field or maintenance technician measure the pressure drop across the TXV? Measure the pressure drop. Okay, well, actually, you know what? What I would actually say, here's what I would actually say about that. So we have a online sizing software. It is free called Virtual Engineer on our website. And what I would what I would actually do if I was you is you can go on there first and you can punch in the exact operating conditions to see how much pressure drop you have across your distributor. So you'll find your distributor model that you have in the field. You can figure out how much pressure drop you have across the distributor and you can backtrack that way to figure out how much pressure drop you have across the expansion valve because your combined pressure drop across the distributor and the expansion valve is going to be known based on your high side pressure relative to your evaporator pressure awesome. i think that's how i would answer that question all right um and then this is uh Kind of similar to what I was, I think, or no, I was a little different. Um, 
they were asking if the OROA is equal to the headmaster. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah. So the head, the headmaster, that is kind of everyone, kind of everybody calls headmaster is a general term for your mechanical head pressure control valve. Uh, the headmaster was a ALCO valve, I believe, which is really equivalent more to our LAC. Okay. But everyone kind of uses the term headmaster just to describe any mechanical head pressure control valve. It's kind of the Kleenex of head pressure control valve, if you will. Okay. And then, let's see here. I do have one that I'll send to you after. Um, here is one more. Um, when would you want to flood the condenser um, during the summer? So I would, you know what? You really do not want to flood the condenser during the summer. Um, yeah, flooding of the condenser really only designed to be done during the low ambience to keep that head pressure from falling too low. If the condenser was sized properly for the worst case scenario or the dead of the summer, you don't want to flood that condenser during the summer because that condenser needs to have the ability to reject all that heat during the summer. Awesome. Well, just want to double check and scroll through these and make sure I'm getting getting all of them answered for everyone here. Um, now that looks like it was it. So um, thank you, Adam, again for tonight's presentation, and thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. Um, for those of you who would like to view this presentation at a later date, um, I'm going to change my screen over to myself here so you guys can see it. You're going to, uh, you can do so in the next few days on the members only section of rses.org, which I can show you how to get to right now. Um, to view this webinar as well as other previous webinars, log in at rses.org by clicking sign in at the top of the page. Then click the home page button here. Um, once you are logged in, and when you get to your member portal, that home page button is going to turn to orange at the top left. Once you are in the home page, you're going to want to hover hover over the training tab and go down to webinar archives. And uh, you'll be able to view that um, within the next. It should be up within the next 24 hours. And um, also, I just wanted to mention that webinar attendees from tonight's live event will receive a certificate for completing one hour of continuing education about one day after this event ends. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me at webinars at rses.org. Again, that's webinars at rses.org. Um, thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. This webinar is now concluded. All right. Thanks, Sean. No problem. Thank you, Adam.